now I'd just like to welcome everyone to FX webinar on the electric vehicle transition. Um, my name's Josh Brewer. I'm the Senior Business Development Manager at FX. Um, I've got an absolutely fantastic stellar panel today. We're going to be talking about the electric vehicle transition, um, what are the barriers to that, what are the issues, but also where the opportunities lie as well. So if I just quickly run through to our guests, we've got Joel Teague, who's the CEO of CoCharger. Co they're currently oh, they're raising on. finance on FX. I've got Paul Tyrrell, Events and Relationships Manager of My Energy. Um, Sarah Sloman, Head of Future Mobility Partnerships at Elmtronics. Helen Scholes, Marketing Manager at CoCars, who have also previously raised finance on FX. And Stefano, uh, who is a co-charger host. And I think what well, just to start off, I think if I just bounce around and everyone gives like 30 seconds or so on their organisation. So Helen, you're at the top left of my screen, so I'll start with you. Hi, yes. So as Josh said, we had a fantastic share raise with FX last year. Um, so I work for CoCars. We are a social enterprise based down in Devon. We're a car club, um, but we're a lot more than that as well. We also offer electric bike share and e-cargo bike services. So everything we do is around this sort of virtuous circle of services that enables people to affordably transition to electric vehicles, whether that's two wheeled, four wheeled, or whether they want their groceries delivered by e-cargo bike. Fantastic, thank you. And Sarah, go over to you. Thank you so much. I'm Sarah Sloman, the Head of Future Mobility Partnerships at Elmtronics. Elmtronics are an installer and provider of electric vehicle charging points and software to support that if you're a fleet manager or homeowner. So to congratulate CoCharger on everything they're trying to achieve for decarbonisation through a sharing platform. And that's what we do at Elmtronics. We like to share our knowledge, share our expertise and share our best practice and guidance. So thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. And Kate, over to you. Hi, I'm Kate Tyrrell from My Energy. I'm the Events and Relationship Manager. And what we do is we are proudly UK manufacturers for renewable energy products for use at home. Um, mainly, I think what we'll be talking about today is the Zappi product, um, which is used by quite a few co-charger hosts, I believe. So, yeah, really excited about the way that Joel's, you know, made charging so much more accessible and looking forward to discovering that a bit more. Great, and then Stefano. Uh, hi, I'm Stefano Tonelli. I'm, I'm a host on CoCharger. Um, have been a, an EV evangelist and, and greening evangelist for a while. Um, I'm here just to kind of talk about what it's like to be a host and also to remind people that if you live in an area where there isn't a lot of charging and you have a charger, maybe sharing it might be a good idea. Yeah. And on that note, let's put across, go across to Joel. Okay, well, Joel T, CEO uh, of, of CoCharger. We're still the, the only dedicated uh, platform for uh, community charging. We kind of invented the term. And uh, just here to sort of share the, the, the wider solutions on, on how we can get people out of their fossil fuel cars quicker. Brilliant. Okay, thanks for that, guys. Um, so just before we dive in there, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. So just to say that the aim of this webinar is to look at what's sort of driving EV uptake in the UK, maybe look at some of the barriers and some of the solutions to those. It's important to say it's not a financial promotion. Um, we can't answer any questions on individual circumstances. Um, we've got a chat function, so people can post questions in there. What I'll try and do is I might try and work those into the ongoing conversation or, or come to them at the end. Um, if we don't have enough time to answer all the questions, we'll do a follow-up session where we'll record some question answers and we'll, put, we'll post that up on the site as well. Um, as I say, uh, it's going to be recorded, this webinar. We'll put it up on our YouTube channel. It'll be on the website as well, so you can watch it or share it. Um, we'll also send out some follow-up emails with a few links to some of the resources we talk about. We'll aim for around about 45 minutes. It, we might go on a little bit longer if there's loads of questions. So hopefully that's okay with everyone. So... Without any ado, let's let's get started. And, and I think, I mean, it, fantastic timing. We had the International Panel on Climate Change report yesterday, which just sort of gave the, the terrifying reality of climate change and just demonstrates why it's so important we transition uh, away from fossil fuels and, and EVs are a key part of that. But I think even though this is kind of a high profile policy framework, such as the UK government's 2030 target to, to stop um, selling internal combustion engine vehicles, I think there's still a lot of challenges out there and CoCharger is an organization that addresses some of those key challenges about enabling EV transition. Um, they're currently raising finance on, on FX. 
to further scale up and it's, it's they've got a really innovative sort of model of community charging um, come and take a look at the ethics website you can download their offer documents find out more any questions come and ask us but Joel if I could just turn to you first I think could you find outline the context a little bit more um, I think particularly around the challenges of charging and maybe how it requires a change of mindset yeah I think that's the important way to look at it um, obviously the EV transition is is underway and accelerating which is great but that brings huge changes and new opportunities in how we run our vehicles and being able to charge a car at home or at work or on a neighbor's driveway is going to come to the fore as the most important thing. Um, with co-charger, we, we saw this coming a couple of years ago, and that's what we've been putting together for, for two years. And it's still the only community charging platform. Uh, it basically, for those who don't know, it enables somebody like Stefano, who has a charger, to make it available for regular rentals to a handful of neighbors so that those people can make the switch to an electric car. So it means that basically no driveway, no problem is what we're aiming for. Um, and yeah, we, we, we invented the term community charging. I, I think what might help is to explain why sometimes it's hard to, to say why that's important. Um, and we found that there's a common barrier. We saw it in the Transport Select Committee report last week. It made some really good points, but it also had this really common non sequitur that led to the whole thing being a bit misguided, which is they're treating fueling an, a, 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 a fossil fuel car as a yardstick. And that's completely wrong. You shouldn't. It's a natural thing to compare charging a car to fueling a car, but it doesn't work in practice. Um, and that's led to some pretty poor planning in places. So we've got a much better model. So if you can bear with me for five minutes, I will take you quickly through that. And um, hopefully um, that, that will help a bit of understand. So uh, now's the time to be sharing my screen, isn't it? Ah, except the card. Julie, if you could just move Joel across to host, could you? Yeah. Right. Oh, I'd rather not take the witty approach, which is the <laughs> next slide, please. Are you able to post that now, Joel? I can't share yet. No. Okay. Um, or just put the well, slides. Here we go. With okay. it. Let me just share these and, and uh, talk through them. So, time to rethink things. Um, if you think about it, why do we stop? Why do we make time when we're driving a fuel car to stop and, and refuel it? It's not because it's what we want to do or it's convenient. You know, stand there in all weathers and chuck toxic flammable stuff inside your car. That's the only way you can do it. We have to. Um, EVs can be charged anywhere that there's electricity. Um, and that means it, it's not about what we have to do, it's what we can do. It's just like your mobile phone. So I'm trying to encourage people, we've just had a really good webinar on fleet, same applies to them, stop thinking fueling vehicles, start thinking mobile phones with wheels. And that in practice, when people can charge where they want to, where it's convenient, it means pretty much at home where they're asleep or at work. Um, and elsewhere is the exception. An awful lot of reports are so obsessed with destination and route charging and public charges, and it, it leads to some very strange prioritization. So the model we've come up with, um, if that's showing okay, yep. um, is it's much more a user-driven model, um, and it's called the base route destination, the BRD model. Um, and going from the bo bottom right-hand side, I'm assuming you're seeing this okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, destination charging, we're familiar with that. As an EV owner, while I'm out, I may as well plug in while I'm at the gym or the shops or whatever. We're familiar with that, so I don't have to bother stopping on the way home or so that I can save a bit of money on my electricity bill. Uh, route charging, the glamour puss gets all the, uh, the attention because I think because it most closely resembles electric fuel pumps, we obsessed with it. Um, it's I'm gonna stop on the way somewhere because I'm doing more than my vehicle's range, therefore I'll stop and have a cup of coffee, plug in, carry on. Um, base charging is 90%, roughly, depending on whose research you believe, it's around 90% of charging. And the key difference here is that it's not about an EV owner. Base charging, is this, as a motorist, I need a reliable, affordable means to charge a car while at home or at work so that I can switch to an electric vehicle. So, Thanks, John. So, John, would you be able, sorry, John, would you be able to just... Um, Set this off as a, as a slideshow so you can expand the sides a little bit. 
Is oh, I'm sorry, are you saying... Happy? Yeah, we're seeing the... Uh... Should be seeing that. That's great. And that hasn't moved on. There you go. Is that better? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm doing great on the tech today. So <laughs> going back to base charging. So base charging is where it's at. We need far more focus on it. We know that from research by people like Connected Curve, without a base charging option, people don't shift. You're four times more likely to have an EV if you've got a home charger. Um, so in terms of decarbonisation, it's where it's at. In terms of demand and therefore revenue, it's where it's at. In terms of scale, we're getting very excited about 20,000 public charges. We're coming up on half a million home and workplace chargers that are used for, what, five hours a week? And in terms of scalability, public chargers, we're adding 500 to 1,000 a month. We're adding 500 a day of home and workplace chargers. So that is where the importance is. So looking a bit closer at that, destination charging and route charging, we're familiar where they are because we never stop talking about it. But we need to look far more at the 90% of the base charging and it's roughly half and a half. Um, half of households, 14 and a half million, they, they've got somewhere to put a home charger and that's great. That's their base charging sorted. But for the other half, the flats, the, 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 the terraces, the people in rented properties, place properties where the car park's too far away, that sort of thing. What do those other people do? What's their options? And from the bottom up, workplace, if, you can, if you've got an employer and you go there often enough and they let you use the charger, great, you can have an EV. Uh, mobile charging, charge ferry, my favorite thing, they will literally turn up in the middle of the night with a great big pink van full of batteries and charge your car. It's fairly expensive, but it's a really good thing. Curbside, you've got people like Connected Curb and Ubertricity, making sure that where you can put things along the curbside, that's great. Community charging, though, that's the only one that gives you that sort of holy trinity of benefits of it's dependable, so I can book it and I can turn up and it's always going to work. It's convenient, so it's while I sleep, pretty much, um, and it's affordable. So I haven't had to buy a charger, but I'm still getting uh, cheap electricity. So that's why we need to be looking more closely at that. And just a, a very quick look at the way that pans out in terms of who's where. On the right, this is very important stuff. Um, you'll notice these are people building their networks. A lot of them are actually owned by fossil fuel companies transitioning their existing fuel networks over to electric. And what we're trying to get across to them, and, and some of these guys have really grasped this, if, if they don't help base charging, their market is half. Their return on investment is double. So it's in everybody's interest to look at that 90% and make sure there is, and here's the hashtag, charging equality, everybody needs their base charging option. Uh, and yeah, we've got people like Podpoint and uh, Good Energy Run One Point doing really good work, helping companies to get more workplace charges in place, uh, which by the way, can also be community charges. Uh, Charge Ferry I mentioned, uh, Ubertricity, Connected Curb and others doing curbside. Right now, uh, CoCharger is still the only platform doing the only option that gives you all three of the benefits that we need. So that's nice. what we've got to. That's um, great. Thanks, Joel. Okay. Uh, if you could just stop sharing that, and we can just go back to the main. And I think I'd just like to throw out a bit of a, a broader question to the to the panelists. If, uh, you know, why own an EV? Kate, shall I start with you on that? Okay. Um, I mean, for me, it's all about the driver experience. I really enjoy you know the torque when you accelerate. You're straight off the line, past all the boy races, <laughs> the traffic lights. Um, it's a much smoother ride. So I use my car locally where I live in Portsmouth, but also my energy head office is up in Grimsby. So maybe once or twice a month, I need to travel up to, to Grimsby to see everyone. The range on my car is about 280 miles, which I can make it and I have done it in one fell swoop, but I will need some of those route chargers like Joel was just mentioning there along the way. So like I'll stop at grid serve or, or whatever along the motorway. Um, just for a little bit of a top up. For me, it is hugely convenient. I am lucky enough that I do have a Zappy on my drive. Um, and even in fact, that I even have a driveway in Portsmouth because that's basically unheard of. Um, and that's why I'm also a host uh, on the CoCharger platform as well. Uh, so for me, it's I get to wake up, jump in my car, go, don't have to stop at a dirty petrol station and taking all those lovely fumes whilst I'm fueling my car. I don't even need to think about it. 
the expense um, of fuel isn't an issue for me anymore because I'm just paying for my electricity um, and and the driver experience. Yeah, that's why I, I love driving electric. And, and then let's not forget the bigger issue at hand is the planet, the health of the planet. So I feel much better knowing that my daily journeys are you know, guilt free, um, which is why I just love driving electric. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and Sarah, how about you? For me, um, I'm a big believer in the transport hierarchy, which means you have to choose the right tool for the job. So whether that's public transport or private transport, that's your, your, your decision making process is yours. But for EVs, it's about clean air for me. We know that we've got a long way to go before EVs can be truly carbon neutral. And we haven't seen the rebirth of the secondhand market or the battery replacement schemes yet. But this is what science is about, is evolving and taking what we've got, doing the best we can with it and making it better than it was. So even when I started this journey six years ago, there was virtually no choice for electric vehicles. It was seen as a very niche thing. And what really excites me and what's exciting about being here today is that people are starting to understand that they've not only got choice, they've got flexibility ability too and that's why it's great we've got Helen here to talk about sharing because we don't have to own our asset having an EV is obviously going to be better than diesel or petrol for clean air and health but we mustn't neglect public transport and the fact that active travel keeps people healthy and safe as well. Yeah that's great thank you and yeah so I caps that in terms of owning an EV uh, but uh, Helen I guess you guys have got a slightly different take on that at CoCast. We have got a slightly different take and you know Sarah made a really good point around that hierarchy of transport um, and that's absolutely something we believe in and for us it's around enabling active travel, it's enabling a better choice of public transport, it's enabling access to electric vehicles that you can pay by the hour when you need them. But we also accept that, you know, for, for a large percentage of people, there is also still a requirement to own. Um, and there's, there's a big crossover, particularly with our members, you know, people still own a car, but they use us as a second car. Um, so we're kind of like a great backup, but overall we're reducing car usage. Um, for me, I think, you know, again, echoing what Sarah said, you know, it's around the clean air. So a uh, recent survey by CACI, 77% of consumers see zero emissions as the main benefit to having an EV. So it's, it is good to see that this is starting to filter through now to the general public, that actually this really is, you know, it is a game changer, chamber, changer, can't speak. Um, and as I'm sure as everybody's seen, you know, there are around 40,000 deaths a year, which are attributable to air pollution. Um, and again, you may have caught in the news a little while back, that there was a landmark ruling by a coroner recently that actually directly implicated the death of a child because of poor air quality. So, you know, there are direct consequences of these choices we make. And I think having the IPCC report come out yesterday has only hammered this home further. Um, and, you know, I just really hope that, that this is a journey that, oh God, we're going to be using journey way too much in this, aren't we? But it's a journey that more and more people will be willing to embrace because really there's no downsides to it. You know, it's, it's all a positive step forward. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks. For that. And, and I think that's it, it is a journey, but I mean, I think that that's relevant for this particular webinar. And, and Stefano, as a, as a self professed evangelist for EVs, and what, what's the key things for you? I'll start by saying that for me, Dieselgate was really the big slap in the face that woke me up. Um, I mean, I'd already been trying to change my lifestyle. Uh, and, and I, at the time I owned a diesel, believing it to be as good as they told us it was for the environment. Uh, but when, when, when Dieselgate broke, uh, it was kind of like a rude awakening for me. So, you know, number one was moving to an EV as soon as possible, which at the time, if you wanted something that could drive for long distances meant going for a Tesla. But ever since then, um, I've now gotten to the point that I will only use a car if I'm doing a long trip. Um, for, for anything else, I'll either walk or take public transport. And, um, and, and yes, of course, I, I love the fact that my car is, is as green as possible. You know, I'm an octopus, like probably many uh, of, of the people that have made the transition to EV. And I charge at night so that I'm sure that the, the grid is as clean as it can, can possibly be at the time. Um, so really, that, that's that's it. I mean, the, the, the big thing is to do everything you can to reduce your own footprint and try to encourage others through social media and whatnot to, to take little steps. Because, you know, if a thousand people do a small step, it adds up. 
exactly and and i think absolutely that there's you know i think there's a real pent-up demand here for evs but i think maybe there are well, well i think there are barriers that are both perceived and actual and then so it may be useful to understand a little bit more about think, those so, oh, so joel would you like to yeah quickly on that um the barriers piece yeah i i do think uh, we, we've got a, a We've been invited to go and speak with Rachel McLean, Transport Minister, about this, and it's going to be very important um, because basically there are perceived barriers and real barriers. The real barrier is the one that we deal with, which is if I can't charge at home, then it's quite difficult to make it stack up. Therefore, I'll charge at a neighbour's. That's what our bit is. But if you can charge at home, the things you commonly hear are um, it, they cost too much, which used market, that's a different story but we've known for a long time that running a, a new ev is generally cheaper not running uh, the total cost of ownership of the new ev is a lot cheaper we have been taught to look at the ticket price on the window and it's largely irrelevant so i'd encourage anyone considering it look at what you spend look and be honest what you spend on your current car is the depreciation of the car plus the running cost of the car including all those repairs you prefer to forget about so a brand new ev in my case is a fraction of the cost of the old petrol car i was running because it's all under warranty, it costs about five quid or four quid to do 200 miles in it. It's almost, the running costs are tiny. So look at total cost of ownership. The other thing you hear about is, oh, they don't go far enough. And that again comes down to what I was talking about earlier. It's a mobile phone. The reason your mobile phone only has a battery big enough for a day is that's all you need. The reason your fuel car has a 500 mile range is because you have to have it, because you have to stop to fuel it. An EV you don't, you very rarely need to stop to charge an EV away from home. It's a tiny bit of, of, of the reality. So there's a lot of education to be done in terms of getting people to look at their own costs in terms of practicalities and remembering one big thing, which is of, 90, of, of, of people who have tried both electric cars and fuel, 99% are going to get another electric car, not another fuel car. Yeah, Okay, yeah. well, do you have any sort of uh, insights on, on, on the barriers and, and how to overcome those, maybe? Barriers to charging at home, you mean, or, or just adoption? Well, to, to adoption, I think, but, but yeah, maybe charging at home as well. Yeah, 100%. So we actually funded some research um, earlier this year to understand why people wouldn't want to adopt an EV at this point in time. And it did come down to the cost of the vehicle and the perception of the public charge infrastructure. And I think what, what Joel has done here is made charging so much more accessible for those who don't want to jump on the motorway all the time. And, and also for people to understand that, yes, if your car has 200 miles range, how often are you actually driving 200 miles? So when you jump in your internal combustion engine vehicle, um, every day. Does it have a full tank of fuel in it every day? No, it has as much fuel in it as it needs to have. There are people that really rag it into the red, and I think we're all uh, guilty of doing that as well as EV, <laughs> EV drivers. We, you literally, you either really trust your car and you know your car's going to scream at you when it's got less than 10% battery and you know how much range you can push from it, or when you're driving diesel or petrol you would know that you probably got about 50 miles when you went into the red. So it is changing the, the public's perception. How often do you really need to charge? It could be that for people who are making localized journeys, um, they may be driving, you know, between 50 and 100 miles a week. Therefore, having access to a local charger such as your neighbor's charger is a, a really viable solution moving forwards to just pop onto it for about six hours to get your battery up to 100%. Um, at an affordable rate where you're just paying for their electricity and, and then coming back a week later if you need to. And then when you're doing those longer journeys, your co-charger is available all over the UK, as I understand it. So if I was to go up to Grimsby next time, I could find someone domestic to plug into um, and, and just make an easy transaction that way. So it, it depends on the style of your driving, where you're driving to, how often you're driving, um, and how much you want to trust your car. Uh, so really, it is just about addressing that, those issues of public perception around public charge infrastructure, how we change our attitudes towards the different charging methods, and you know what is the overall vehicle cost waiting for that second-hand market to kick in, which I think we're almost on top of. I really feel like that's going to come in in the next year or two. Um, you know, I, 
had a, a chat with Auto Trader at the tail end of last year, and they had something like 600 EVs on their website. And when I went back to them a few months later, it was 8,000 EVs. So it just shows how quickly that is coming into effect now with all these new models being launched all the time, really cool, sexy new models. A lot of people are upgrading and then passing their old EVs onto first time EV drivers. So I I think it's a a really exciting time. Um, And it is just about having the conversation. I'm noticing there's a lot of chat going on as well at the moment in the chat box. There's some really good questions coming through, um, mainly around the cost of charging. So, you know, co-chargers making it at cost of the electricity. They do um, make a suggestion as to how much you might want to charge someone um, per hour, which is really reasonable. I think the average is £1.75. Um, I think I've put mine around that. Um, So if you need to charge a car for six hours to get to 100 percent, that's nine pound for me in the Kona. That's 280 miles range. When was the last time you was able to put nine pounds in your car and drive for 280 miles? So the benefits are clear. Great. Thank you. And um, Helen, I mean, move over to you and what you think maybe the barriers are. And I guess to maybe to EVs, but maybe to, to co-use of, of um, transport solutions as well. Um, I think we probably covered the main points. I mean, I don't think there's anything vastly different from what we all know, that it's around price, it's range anxiety, it's perceived lack of charging infrastructure. There are things that come up time and time again that, that put people off. Um, I mean, clearly from a co-cars perspective, we overcome the price by making electric cars available from £5.50 an hour, which, you know, if you are EV curious, if you are at that point of thinking, this is what I want to do next, We're also a great way of kind of providing that bridge to help people get comfortable with how an EV actually works in practicality. You know, it's no different from plugging in a big appliance. I really like Joel's analogy about it's your mobile phone because it basically is just with a much bigger lead. Um, And if you do it a few times, you're there thinking, wow, this is this is so easy. You know, Um, I think, you know, There is a lot of misinformation set out there. I don't want to get too controversial, but I'd say maybe our own government is not helping this at the moment with some of the comments that have recently come out around propensity to move to EV vehicles by people who should be perhaps encouraging it. Um, So, you know, the messaging needs to get a lot stronger and a lot more coherent from top down. Everybody in this room, we're doing everything we can to help overcome those barriers and get people to understand it's really not that difficult, but, it would really help if there was some some uh, some support from that at the higher levels and it was coming out consistently. Joel, oh, so just go. I was just going to say, yeah, on that, Quentin Wilson was was very eloquently expressing that in all his sort of forty odd years in in journalism, he's never seen such an amazingly concerted effort of misinformation. Yeah, uh, that it is yeah. pretty terrifying. It's almost as if there's some trillion dollar industries with an interest in maintaining the status quo. Um, but also, we, I mean, a good example um, we, we've had in the comments about uh, which one was it? it was about how can the national grid cope? Um, funnily enough, the people who published the report and um, Graham from, from National Grid has been banging on about this for over a year now. Not a problem. National Grid say it's not a problem. The only people saying it is a problem, funnily enough, are quite hard to track down. But everybody is getting this message about, oh, where's the electricity coming from? It's fine. It's dealt with. So there's an awful lot of that. That 99%, ask yourself, if there are all these barriers, explain the 99%. In truth, most of the barriers aren't there when you actually look at them. Sorry. Sorry. On on Joel's point about the national grid, yes, Graham has been reassuring us for quite a long time now that we can cope, but also we are daily building new industrial size wind, solar, farms, battery storage units. But what I forgot to mention earlier as well on the whole, um, how much does it cost to charge thing is the Zappi charger can be used with solar. So if you're lucky enough to have solar on your roof, it's free to charge your car. Um, And likewise, all of that energy is going to be coming from solar wind and and battery storage units in, in the future with the government's ambitions to develop a lot more of that on a much bigger scale across the country and globally as well. It is a global thing. Everybody wants to move to cleaner, cleaner energy. 
Sorry, Helen. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I was going to drop into that as well. So, you know, we are, as well as, as uh, our involvement with CoCharger, obviously when we deploy cars, we, we work with all kinds of organisations from private businesses to, you know, uh, housing developers to all sorts. So there's lots of different solutions we're involved with. Um, and one of the projects we've got rolling out at the moment, Rapid Charging Devon, is uh, rapid chargers within local neighbourhoods. So it's kind of a step, the next step beyond having your neighbor using your neighbour's charger, it's having a rapid charger on your street and it's very much targeted towards local people. Um, but the energy we're using for that uh, is sleeved via a solar farm based literally like 20 miles up the road. So it's sleeved energy, you know, I mean, it is, it is an equivalence through the grid, but very much looking at that again, 43% of UK energy generated by renewables now. So that is increasing all the time. Um, there's also all the stuff around battery to grid as well. So, you know, that there's going to be an increasing amount of battery storage units, i.e. your cars sitting around. And I know energy providers are already looking into this, that this energy is sitting there that can be pulled back into the grid when those cars aren't in use. And as a car owner, you can be paid for that. So there is just so much change happening at the moment. Um, it's, I think, all of us trying to keep up with it we've all got pieces of the puzzle we've all got really good pieces of the puzzle that we're all trying to fit together to make things better i think that's yeah and thank you for that that sort of starting to put that you know future perspective on it as well because i think that's the really key, key thing it's such a changeable space and i suppose it would be useful to get you the insights of the panel on where you think we're going to go over the next five to ten years and so sarah if i could cross over to you on that one Oh, thank you. That's really kind. Electronics specialise in home charging and fleet charging. So we're working with lots of big organisations who are facing this change and people will have to take their vehicles home. Now, the housing stock in the UK is such that most have got a driveway. It's sort of 50 to 60 percent is the predicted number of people who can charge at home. However, I still feel like that's too high because there's going to be people who within that category have got special conditions on their home, which mean it's very difficult to get a charger put in without planning consent. There will also be people who just don't want it. And actually a solution like co-charger can fill that gap. I've got people in, I saw a comment, comment in the text about rurality and the fact that it's very difficult to find EV charging unless you're on a motorway or have, the, as we described, a driveway. So something like co-charger coming along has really helped to connect people's minds to that future prospect where if you were currently buying a plug-in hybrid because you want that stepping stone between fossil fuel through to electric vehicle, then a co-charger situation can work really well because you're not going to have to completely be there for hours and days. So the flexibility is yours and it's a community. So you find somebody local to you who you know and trust. So the whole thing is built around people trusting people. In terms of futuristic proposition, I foresee that we perhaps are making an error by trying to swap out every single internal combustion engine with an electric vehicle instead. And we, we should be focused on alternative modes of travel, improved public transport, and fleet solutions which aren't reliant on a four-wheeled vehicle, perhaps a trike or an e-bike or a scooter could be good. So it's about freeing up road space is the future we need to aim for. So the essential vehicles, the essential fleet can utilize the city centers to get the goods and services where they need to go, but without polluting the environment of all those newly walking pedestrianized public transport people. So we don't wanna get them out of their car and then gassed we want them to be out of their car and enjoying their active travel where possible and then utilizing public transport where not possible. The individual car ownership is a model that we can see already in the last three years changing dramatically. People are considering what options they've got for leasing instead of owning. They're even doing a monthly rolling membership option. So instead of, instead of a year, two years, three years, one month and then you can give the car back so perhaps you just own it for the summer if you wish yeah. so it's about flexibility the future will be about flexibility and it will be about making choices that suit your lifestyle and making sure that you're doing everything you can to think about decarbonization and getting to net zero thank you sarah and i think i'm very conscious of time and we've got a whole lot of questions coming in um uh, one joel if you had a very quick point and if we go on to move on to the question i just wanted to take a very rare opportunity i'm going to say something nice about government policy i i um that's one thing about the decarbonization plan i thought they really nailed they started with let's not need the cars and then worked inwards and that's why you know it's very important we're part of a group of co-cars is it's it's not about getting people into evs it's about stop burning stuff so i agree with that and it's one thing where i think the government are absolutely on it I was just going to add quickly, I think, you know, the, the phrase that we sort of bandy about within co-cars is about creating space for people. It's this whole idea of placemaking. Um, and actually, you know, if you think about what we sacrificed to the car over the last 40 years, 
you know we're looking at around a third of urban land which is either directly for cars or car related infrastructure so you know that that's our space this is this is not mythical space this is you know look down the road when you're walking around see how much space is given over to cars so absolutely you know i completely agree with everything sarah was saying as well it's it's giving people those choices you know thinking about actually these should be people-centric places cars are an enabler like other forms of transport they allow you to to experience your day better get where you need to go but it shouldn't be for the sake of taking over everything else yeah, thanks, Anne, absolutely on that. And, and I, so one of the questions that has come in, so I want to try and address some of these questions while I can, and it's about the practicalities of being a host. And I think, Stefano, you'd probably be the, the natural person to, to answer that. And the concern that's come up is, you know, how do we organise the fact that there might be a car that's normally parked in that driveway? How do I ensure that that, that, that isn't in there? And it's, I suppose it's the, the practicalities of it, really. Well, I mean, in, in my case, um, I have enough space for two cars on my driveway. So all I need to do when I'm, when I'm having a, a chargee coming is make sure that my car is out of the way so that they can gain access to the charger. So I guess that's really what a host needs to consider is wh whether they can in fact uh, easily move their car out of the way when, when they need to. Um, yeah. But really that would be the only, that would really be the only problem yeah. You and, and in terms of setting setting the price as well, that's done by. I I just use the 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 rule of thumb that CoCharger provided. It's like a, a you know a multiplier of what you pay for your for your electricity. So I think it's what 20, 20 or twenty two pence a kilowatt for the for the chargee, which is still interestingly enough better than anything else they could get around here. On either Ubitricity, uh, Source London, or any of the faster charging options. Great, thank you. And, and one of the questions coming is about you know there's quite a few questions about how can I be sure that there's you know it's renewable sources of electricity that that I'm charging with. And maybe Kate, there's been a question there about can you know can you link Zappi to solar panels, for instance? So yeah, so Zappi was designed with that exactly in mind. So. Um, Zappi diverts, uses the excess solar power, diverts it directly into the car. So you're literally driving on sunshine, but you can have a Zappi even if you don't have solar. So even if you have a Zappi installed now and you use your normal energy to charge a car and you want solar fitted in the future, there are products that can link that all together and make it a nice, simple transition for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just, just a point on that, we did some interesting research on, um, obviously, if, if, if you're going to have an EV, please use renewables to run it. Uh, we found that over 90% of our hosts are already on a renewables contract. Yeah, exactly. And once we then took that and we factored in the, the relative efficiencies of uh, fuel cars, basically, if you include the, the whole supply chain of getting petrol into a car and burning it, an average car is doing about 3,000 kilograms of CO2 a year. If you factor in that 90% of, of EVs are run on, on renewables, the average EV in Britain is putting out less than 30 kilograms a year. It's that big a difference. So anybody who says, oh, they're not that green, they really are. <laughs> yeah, I think that is something that comes up quite a lot, actually, isn't it? And it's, it's good to be able to have a, to, to be able to respond in, into that. I'm having a quick sort of some practical questions coming in actually. It's probably girls' bear sons. Is co-charger available in the Republic of Ireland? Not yet, sadly. We're um, we're getting everything going in uh, UK first, and we're already looking. I think we've been approached by ten countries, um, and we'll be looking to get into some countries. Uh, yes, uh, Ireland's likely to be one of the first. We would really like to start that next year. Okay, and and uh, there's another question. I don't know if anybody is. Uh, has a caravan, but can you tow a caravan with an EV? I yes, don't know who that question should go to. <laughs> you can. Okay. Some of them. Great, fantastic. And I, the last one that's coming is: um, Have you been, has CoCharger or you know any of this sort of shared um, kind of charge approaches been working with parish councils and particularly looking at rural areas and being provided being able to provide kind of rural options for charging? Um, short answer is yes, it's a slow process. Uh, we've positioned ourselves, I mean, the strategy is solve as many problems for as many people as we can. 
Um, hence the, the app, you know, it doesn't cost anything. There's no contracts, there's no subscriptions, nothing like that. So that it can be just dropped in as a tool in the box for organizations to do that sort of patchwork of solutions. And yes, it's being used um, various local authorities and also community groups are just using, it. it's free, you just, you just sign up for it. So it's being used a lot um, without putting too fine a point on it or flexing much. Um, that's the map. <laughs> as, as a little while ago, it's been growing on average over 30% a month this year. So it is a matter of we get the, 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 the density up, but the general message is it's just there, just use it. And local authorities are picking up on that. Great. And, and Sarah, I see you're responding in the chat around um, community. And, and it'd be, I mean, do you feel that the AV option adoption is, is an opportunity to, to create more you know, cohesive communities? I really do. It's a perfect opportunity to make someone dwell. We know that high streets thrive when people are there for two or three hours at a time. The time not just to thrive economically, although that is a proven fact, but thrive from an emotional and social perspective as well. Just seeing people that you know, and it's a regular thing that you do because you can't charge at home, so you're reliant over there on that charger that you know. And it just becomes a situation where in a tight-knit community, particularly rural communities, you are rebuilding that sense of looking after each other. And if anything from last year, as horrible as it was, showed us that we are actually there for each other. And if you can tie in infrastructure and technology into that wonderful touchy feely vibe as well, then you're on, to, you're on to a winner. And that footfall is so important. We know that pedestrians and cyclists do actually spend more in the high street than car drivers. So if you can couple that with a car driver who isn't polluting the village or town, but who is also having a footfall advantage, then that's got to be a win. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, well, we are pretty much out of time. So I'd just like to quickly just run around the run around the um, panel and just just ask you each to just give your sort of like 30 second summary of, of, of where you see the EV space going, you know, and, and where it's at at the moment. So Stefan, I'll start with you. Well, it's getting better by the day. I mean, just a few years ago, you only had two or three choices. Now, every day, there's a new car being launched. Um, that said, I think personally we're going towards a robotoxy society, which I think a lot of people on this panel will be happy about. Um, people are just going to start using cars as, as, a, as a commodity that they just get into when they need one yeah. and not actually own them anymore. Yeah. Maybe that's 10 years in, in the future, maybe only five, who knows. But but we, it is a, it is a direction of travel. Isn't I it? think and, it's and the Kate. direction we're going to. Yeah, and and Kate. Yeah, just to echo exactly that sentiment, things will never be as bad as they are today. So the infrastructure is growing every day. New cars are coming about every day. More people are logging on as a co-charger host every day. Um, more renewable energy sources are being built every day. More awareness in the public is, is finally people are taking climate change much more seriously under not such great circumstances. Um, but for me, it is a, it's an exciting time to be a part of this industry. Um, and it's an exciting time for the planet. You know, my niece and nephew, they love it. They get in my car and they're like, this is a spaceship. It sounds like a spaceship. And they point out Teslas or Porsche Takers like when we're on, on the street and it's suddenly really cool and not so cool if you're driving something that's pumping a load of dirty fumes into the air. So attitudes are changing. You know, the children are really embracing this as, as something for the future, which just makes me a lot more hopeful. So, yeah, I just feel hopeful. Exactly that. My kids are definitely pestering me about, about an EV. That's where the, a lot of the pressure is coming from. <laughs> yeah. If I could pass over to you and see, get, get your sort of sort of summation of where we are. Sorry, was that Amy or Helen? Yes, yes, yes. Sarah. Sarah. OK, thank you. Well, I think. Um, for one, I can see in the chat that people want to do this again. This has been really useful, so we'll definitely count us in for round two. But I think from me personally, this is there's never been a better time to just do something. We're in IPCC code red for humanity, as we know. Climate change emergency has been declared. Everyone's talking about it. So just take all the information in that you've learned today, digest it, ask us questions, connect on LinkedIn, and we'll just continue to chip away at those misconceptions and problems and barriers and remove them and get to a position where you're comfortable with your choice and comfortable with the carbon impact that you have in your day-to-day -day life. And that's what we all need to do. So more of this, more collaboration, and more friendly exchange of truth and fact and fiction. Thank you. And Helen, past to you. 
Yeah, I think picking up on what Stefano was saying about, you know, cars as a commodity, I'd like to put my hand up and say, well, that's exactly what we're doing. We're offering people mm. an opportunity to only use a car and only pay for the hours you use it. That's it. Walk away. Um, I mean, in terms of the cars that we have available, we are about to make a big transition by introducing uh, Volkswagen ID3 and ID4s into our fleet. So up until now, we've worked with the Zoe, um, which is a great car, still part of our fleet. But we absolutely see in terms of, again, linking in to what Kate was saying, people's perception around electric cars and seeing that this, these cars are now available for them to hire by the hour is absolutely the way for us to go. And those should be launching in the next month or two. Um, I mean, there is, you know, I love, I love the whole community angle. Um, we are also really focused on the rural mobility angle because it is a huge challenge. Um, you know, again, as everybody else has said, please connect with me on LinkedIn if anybody's got any questions or queries about that. We run surveys, obviously living in Devon, lots of rurality around us. Um, we're running surveys at the moment across the whole of West, ha um, West Devon and South Hams, looking at how we can perhaps implement rural mobility solutions for people down there. So there's all sorts of exciting stuff happening around that. I mean, it, it does feel like we're really part of a big movement. Oh God, I'm using puns again, sorry. <laughs> but it's, it's genuinely, I think, you know, I wake up now and think this is what I was meant to do. And it's, it's genuinely exciting and genuinely feel like, you know, you have an opportunity to make a really positive difference in the world. Um, so, you know, it's a big group hug to everybody in the room, really, because that's what we're all aiming for. Um, but it Fantastic. is, you know, I feel very passionate about it. I think it's, it's a brilliant time to be involved with this business. I think that's I think that's what's really come through is everyone here is really passionate about it. And, and uh, you know, and, and I think we're all evangelists in, in, in our way. And jo Joel, could I just pass to you to just sort of finish off there and, and just kind well, of. Yeah, I, I think Helen's put the, the community side of it beautifully. I think we're actually starting to see um, a sort of triumph of, of community over, let's face it, some, some corporate interests that have perhaps have been pushing us in the wrong direction for a long time. You know, we spotted a particular barrier at Cocharger two years ago, and we spent those two years getting, turns out I think we've got it pretty much right. You know, in eight months, we've gone from zero to being seventh biggest network. We're on course to being the biggest. And that's through communities. It's through people saying, now, actually, I'm going to stop my neighbours giving money to big oil, and I'm going to channel it through my renewable energy instead. I think that's a real triumph. It's all worked. Um, obviously, we're very excited that the doors that are opening from the minister to big car companies, everybody's getting on board with this now. We've, we've hit that critical mass. People are using it. People have ditched and scrapped ice cars because of co-charger, and that's, that's the real you know, champagne moment for us. And yeah, it's just one component of this, um, but it's a very exciting time, and it feels like that snowball's rolling now. So, um, yeah, and if anybody, just to say, if anybody's got questions or whatever, really have to talk to people, just, just get in touch. Thanks, John. Yeah, and, and, all, and thank you to all the panel, Kate, Sarah, Helen, Stefano. It's been a fantastic and really, really, you know, really great conversation. And, and I think we're seeing a lot of people in the, in the chat wanting more, so maybe we can reconvene this at another point in time. Um, we've got quite a few questions that I don't think we've been able to answer, but as Joel says, we'll, we'll, we'll Put a session together and try and answer all those questions and and get that out but i'll just uh yeah i'd just like to echo what everyone else has said it feels like we're a bit of a tipping point and it's we're moving in the right direction and, and and we need to do that so just thank you very much to everyone um thank you for joining us on the panel today and hopefully uh pick up this conversation again soon thank you so thank much you. Thanks, thank you thanks bye, bye.